on Grand Dance Beach. So what we plan to do, take the bus to the campus. I'm not sure if that gate is ever open anymore to the beach. If it is, definitely feel free to go through because we're going to be meeting right there. But what we're probably going to have to do, once we get off the bus, just walk outside of campus and then down by Umbrellas. Um, does anyone not know where Umbrellas is? Okay, perfect. <laughs> so we're going to walk down through Umbrellas to get to the beach access and then head over to the spot of the beach that's in front of the Great Dance Campus. And we're going to have just a worship session there for about an hour, hour and a half. Feel free to stay as long as you want. And then we're just going to take buses back from Grand Dance Campus to here. If you have your own car, feel free to drive. I know there's parking on campus and also down by Umbrellas. Do bring your own snacks and your own food. Because we couldn't officially book it, we couldn't actually have anything catered this time. So it is a little different in that aspect too, but it sh still should be a really good time of worship in a very beautiful setting. Before I have Madeline and David come up, I just want to mention a couple other things. We are going to be purchasing new sound equipment, which is very exciting, I know, for the worship team. And so starting next week, if you do feel led to donate, we will be having donation boxes in the back. We're not forcing you or begging you to do it, so don't feel like you're being pressured. But if you would like to donate to that, we'd be more than happy to accept your contribution. Also, we are having a coffee break right after service this morning, right out here at the Bourne Tables, just a time of fellowship. We will have some ministry leaders there to talk to, but it's not just a sign up for ministries. This is a time to spend after service just getting to know other CSA members, making Christian friendships within the school. And then one more thing to mention is there will be a worship team meeting next Sunday after service. So Angelina wanted you to put that in your calendar. Just make sure that you don't forget it. If you have any questions, just go see her about that. If I could have David and Madeline come up now, they're going to talk about the Relationships Bible Study. Hello, everyone. My name is Madeline. And I'm David. And we are both uh, term four medical students. We are married, and we are working through this thing called life and the busyness of which, uh, and we also love being married in it. And so we're doing a group uh, based on relationships and talking about what that looks like in today's world, um, what it means to have a Christian relationship with a few different topics, and it's happening every other week. Anyone is welcome, no matter what your status is, if you're, maybe you're here, you have someone at home, or you're just looking to date, especially if you're married or engaged dating, whatever that looks like, we'd love to have you. And we'll be having snacks, and we'd um, have you every other week. Um, so the plan is this Saturday, uh, the 15th, uh, at the Founders Annex at 5.30. Um, so in general, we're shooting have it at 5 most weeks. Um, this week, we got bumped to 5.30, but so 5.30, uh, Founders Annex, we will see you there. Awesome. And it is every other week starting this Saturday. We'll see you then. Uh, just one more thing to mention about worship on the beach, because I realized that was probably not the clearest explanation. But we will be posting a good amount of detail on the page, just about how to get there, what time it is. And if you have any questions that you'd rather just talk to us directly, please see one of the eboard leaders and we can explain what's going on. Um, if I could have the worship team come up, I want to read a passage from Psalm 119, starting in verse 161. The princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart standeth in awe of thy word. I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. Seven times a day do I praise thee because of thy righteous judgments. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Lord, I have hoped for thy salvation, and done thy commandments. My soul hath kept thy testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I have kept thy precepts and thy testimonies, for all my ways are before thee. When I was reading this passage, the verse that really stuck out to me and just really convicted me was verse 162. I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. How many times do we fall into this habit of reading the Bible to mark off our spirituality checklist? Where we're not really seriously trying to get anything out of it. We're just trying to do it so that we can say we did that for the day, we spent our time with God, we're good. How much deeper would our relationship be with God if we looked at his words as one that just found this immense treasure, as one that actually wants to have it and gain it to deepen their relationship with God? I challenge you this week, just like I've been trying to challenge myself, that each time you open this book, Look at it like you've just found great spoil and you've just found this immense treasure because that's what it is. 
oftentimes we take it for granted that that's a dangerous place to be. I eagerly challenge you and just hope that you desire to read this to deepen your relationship with him. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, CSA. Good morning. Oh, are we excited to be here? Okay, I guess uh, Tim Forrest in the house. Yeah, I understand. There's a lot of uh, farm drugs bouncing off your. Is this server? You know, which one is it? Uh, hippocampus? <laughs> so, I don't know. How about, how about Tim Watts? A little one has the. Uh, you know what? I can show you something. The Bible says that time spent in the house of the Lord is never going to be wasted. Can I, I, I'll promise you that. You're, you're going to have a testimony at the end of this week. Can I get an amen? Please stand on your feet. Stand on your feet. And then just turn to somebody. Wait, well, tell, tell the person, happy Sunday. Wish somebody happy Sunday. I just said, I'm happy you listen to the house of the Lord. For the for ten fours, for ten ones, three minutes. Anyone that has exams this week? CFP, oh my people. CFP, CFP, CFP. First exams coming up. I'm, I'm, I'm praying for an awesome presentation for you this morning. That is what I'm praying for. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, it is a joy to be in your presence, to fellowship with brethren. Bible says it's good and pleasant to have brethren fellowship as one accord, for that is where you dwell. Holy Spirit, we invite you into our midst. Father, have your way and visit us this morning. In our worship, Father, visit us with a word. As we exalt you, as we lift you up, may men be drawn unto you. We are desperate for an encounter with you in this place. Show yourself strong and have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Is someone happy? Are you, are you excited? There you go, there you go. Let's... Okay, so I see a very big smile from the Tim Tusa are smiling. They are smiling parables. And then the Tim Force and everyone else is like, yeah, this man needs to hurry up and get out. <laughs> but tonight we're going to worship. Hallelujah. All right, let's bless the team. It's a very simple song, I know you will know it. It says, Forever God is faithful, forever God is true. Oh, okay. 
No turning back. 
and she had an uncle who died, um, who was an avid swimmer, he was like in the Navy, and he was snorkeling and he died. So she put me in swimming classes, which is wonderful, but you have to understand that as a child, I've had the same character, um, which meant I could take a shot from the doctor, but when it came to like submission, like practice, like dance recitals, I wailed all the time. Um, and I remember they put me in these swimming classes, and guys, this is confession time. <laughs> I would hold on to the banister of that YMCA pool, legs crossed, screaming. The rest of the kids are already, like this is guppy style, right? We just had to go to the deep end. And I'm screaming. My mom would say that the poor instructor would have like scratch marks from me just pulling as a no, no, no. Um, and this segues to another part of my life. So I know how to swim. I didn't make it to Barracuda or anything out there because they wanted me to somersault, and I don't even somersault on land, so I wasn't doing it underwater. Um, and I remember going to my first mission trip to DR, and at the end, they kind of took us out to the beach, and we had these lifeboats, and my friends decided, like, let's go kayaking to, like, this little aisle. And I was like, guys, I'm good. Honestly, I don't need to kayak. But they thought that it was because I didn't know how to swim. Because my dad, and I love him, he's gonna see this later, I love you dad, he had told them that I don't know how to swim out of overprotection, and he was like, you know, I don't want her to drown. I knew how to swim. So I remember we got to the dock and I took off my life vest, and I go to jump, and everybody's like, no, 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 And I was like, what? And they're like, uh, uh, put on your life vest. And I'm like, no, if I put on my life vest, I can't go down, I can't open my eyes, I can't see underneath. And they're like, yeah, but you don't know how to swim. And I was like, who told you I didn't know how to swim? I have the dramatic YMCA memories. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, your dad. And I was like, noted, cool. I was like, actually, I didn't know how to swim, and I just jumped right in and enjoyed like everybody else. So there's something beautiful about knowing how to swim and just the ocean. And if you've ever gotten to that point where you've actually dived under or you've snorkeled, there's this whole entire world underneath there. And you're like, wow. I didn't see this from the shore. I didn't see this from above. I didn't see this from where I was, where the waves were crashing, but now there's like little fishes. Has anybody gone to Grand Anson? They're like, there's little fishes. And there's like coral, and there's a whole world. Um, and I remember, as a bio major, taking invertebrate zoology, um, and <laughs> him emphasizing the fact that the Earth's surface is covered in literally 71%. But like only 96.5, well 96.5 of it's from the ocean, but then 95% of it is undiscovered. Like there are canyons bigger than the Grand Canyon. And there are mountains higher than the ones we're used to, all underneath. And there are creatures that have yet to be seen by man's eye. So I want you guys to imagine this. There is a world that we have not seen lying right in front of us. And yet people have a difficulty believing in heaven. <laughs> we don't know what's in the ocean, but it's there, undiscovered, unexplored. So, today I'm gonna be talking from Ezekiel 47, one through 11. And background story. Ezekiel was this Old Testament prophet who not only did he see visions and see what God was doing, but it was very keen. God showed him what he was going to do. Ezekiel was always one step ahead. He was the one with the dry bones. Always one step ahead. Um, and today we're going to be talking about diving in deeper into the living water. So if we start from verse 1, um, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple, and I saw water coming out under the threshold of the temple towards the east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. 
He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate, facing the east. And the water was trickling from the south side. As a man went eastward with measuring line in his hand, and this is where my visual aid comes in here. Do you? Can I help you? So, let me start with the fact that a bit of definition. So a cubit is known in the Old Testament to be very basically from your hand to your elbow, roughly 18 inches unless you're short. So as the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits, which is roughly like a thousand five hundred feet. Right? Let's just assume that. that. <laughs> then he led me to water that was only ankle deep. The man measured another thousand cubits and led me through water that was now knee deep. Then he measured another thousand cubits. Oh, we're going to end. And it was only waist deep. He measured off another thousand. But now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in a river that could not cross, that no one could cross, he asked, son of man, do you see this? So let me explain what's happening here. We have water coming from the temple, which we knew at that time was where the Israelites would go, and the presence of God was there because he was in the holies of holies. And we see that Ezekiel is saying, there is a river coming on all sides of this. And as I'm following it, it's getting deeper. Now, this is not profound. Everybody knows <laughs> that a river starts off small, and as you progress further, it gets deeper. But let's keep on reading. It says, then it led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region and goes down into Arab, where there enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the salty water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large number of fishes because this water, this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So wherever the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shores from Ed Gedi to Ed Galam. There will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many a kind, like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. So like I said, the river, not profound, but when we get to the next verse, we see that not only can this river not be crossed, but at its end, at its bank, everything is living. There are trees growing, there are fish of plenty, and it's turning salt water into fresh water. Now, this is all talking, and this is echoed in Revelations, but today we're going to be talking about diving in deep. And how when we first started with our walk with Christ, we were ankle deep. You remember that? We were like, oh, <laughs> this is new. What do I do about this Jesus? But we were ankle deep. And our problems were probably ankle deep. And it was, it was easy trusting because we could walk right through it. Ankle deep water, you can walk. And then we go a little further and we got knee deep. And, you know, you're feeling a little bit of the resistance, but you can still walk through it. You're like, oh, that's my first, my first test, my first trial. Uh, we got this, Jesus. I can could, I could still see my feet. Then we get to wasting. And now we're feeling the tension and the pull of the current. Has anybody gotten there? Where you've, you've walked, and then you're like, oh, I slipped. And you're like, okay, let me not drown, let me not drown. But now we're feeling this tension, this push, this river that wants to take us wherever it wants us to go. 
And now we're looking at our feet and we're like, I can't see where I'm going. There could be anything here. But then there's a deep end where walking is not good enough. Where seeing the ground where you are isn't good enough. You don't get to enjoy the nice, like, oh, let me pick up stuff. And you don't get to do it yourself. But now you actually have to swim. Or you drown. <laughs> it's, it's obvious there that when he gets there, he says it's deep enough to swim. How many are at that point in their life where God's taking them deep enough that you can't just walk it? That you can't just like feel the push and be like, it's okay, we're going to get through it. <laughs> we're going to get there. No, but now you see that it's too, it's obvious that it's too deep for you to cross. And now, you have to swim. And that's kind of brings us to an interesting situation because all up to this point, there's a level of comfort with feeling the ground. There's a level of comfort with just walking through. You don't need to trust that God's gonna get you there. You don't have to trust that this is not going to overtake you, that your problems aren't going to overwhelm you, that you're going to drown in ankle deep water. Nobody drowns in ankle deep water, hopefully. <laughs> no, hopefully nobody drowns at that. But now this requires effort. And the faith we had before is not going to cover. Now there's an endurance that all of a sudden we require. Michael Phelps didn't swim all those laps just from waking up one day and going to a pool. It was a repetition. But if you're like most people who enjoy the ocean or water or swimming, at some point you've swallowed water and it's not been good. And what do you quickly do? You're to the shallow. You're like, <laughs> you're like well, let me hold on to a ledge. Let me get somewhere. Let me find my feet again. Getting the salt water out of your face. And how many times in our Christian walk do we swallow a little bit of water? And so we quickly retreat to knee deep because this is comfortable. Th this is comfortable. I know knee deep. I know what God requires me in deep. I know what I have to do in knee deep. I don't have to change my lifestyle in knee deep. Knee deep's easy. I could do knee deep. But what happens when God's calling us deeper? What happens when God is leading us to a point that we have to leave our comfort and we have to start swimming. Where our faith is tested not by sight, but in him alone. So the first step is there is this vulnerability. You have to trust that the water is not over, gonna overtake you. You have to trust that he's not gonna let you drown. You have to trust him with your life. And that's a little right. Because we're, we're micromanagers, especially all of y'all here with me included. Like, we got here because we're like, like every little detail. <laughs> And we, we left a point where we're like, okay, I'm going to wake up, I'm going to do this, then that, um, I'm going to make sure, like, you have, how many of you guys have that? Like, you have your life down to a T, <laughs> leaving no space, no space for curveballs, no space. And so, one of the frightening things about jumping into the deep end with God is that you're not in control. It's where the current takes you. It's where he's taking you. Um, I forgot who I messaged this to, but it's this idea that there can only be one hero to your story. 
and that's Jesus. You can't be your own hero. You can't. Has anybody seen that where somebody tries to save themselves from drowning? It's impossible. That's why we have lifeguards. <laughs> you, you can't save yourself from drowning. So there has to be this vulnerability of, Lord, I need to trust you. Here you go. My planning, my safety net, my floaties. <laughs> I'm taking them off and I'm giving it all to you. Teach me how to swim. I'm surrendering. But like I said, we all like the shallows. Because in the shallows, we can splishy splashy. We can floaty right on. We, we don't have to worry. We have our crutches. We have our comfort to hold on to. We don't need to experience God's love fully because we're just good here. Why, why risk so much? So, if you know me, I love Bible verses. So, um, I wanted to show two things. John 37, John 7, 37 to 39. On the last day of the greatest day, great, greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit whom those believe in him were later received. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Then John 4, 10 to 14, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who is that is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it? As did also the sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become like a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So we have these two things, and we realize that, now going back to Ezekiel, this river I've been talking about, that's Christ himself. He is that living water. And we have on two occasions where he explains, you will forever be thirsty. And I know that's a little difficult for you guys to understand. And this campus will forever be thirsty. How many know that's true? <laughs> this campus will forever be thirsty until we drink the living water. He is the only thing that can quench that thirst. The only thing. As we read in before, literally everything that was connected to that living water, to that river, grew. All the fishes, alive. If you looked at the swamps, if you looked at the marsh water, nothing. It was meant for salt, that's all. So, so what good is knee deep water, ankle deep water? Nothing, salt. But in a river, that's where life comes from. That's where sustenance comes from. Things can grow there. See, you need to get to the deep end so that you can grow. Because you probably were wondering this entire time, like, why would I go to the deep end? It sounds so scary. Because that's true. And you know that the moment you were a kid and you cannonballed into the deep end of the pool, that was life. <laughs> you were done with the shallows. You didn't care about Marco Polo. You didn't care about it. Now it was just cannonball, cannonball, dive, dive. Touch the bottom of the pool. The same thing with Jesus. The moment you dive in deep, there's no returning to the shallows. Because every time, there's this exhilaration of jumping, and then this comfort of something just covering you completely. Isn't that true? Don't you jump down, and then you have that split second where you're like, I'm gonna drown, I'm gonna drown, I'm gonna drown. And like, oh, it's water, I'm floating, I'm floating, I'm floating. And you get to the top, 
And I'm like, I need it. <laughs> and that's the same thing with Jesus. It's this exhilarating jump of the unknown and then realizing that the Father is completely covering him. That's why we need the living water. Commitment. <laughs> I know some people have a love-hate relationship with this word. <laughs> but the truth is that the shallows allow you to have a certain level of intimacy and a certain level of commitment. If you knew somebody shallowly, you probably would just call them an acquaintance. You wouldn't call them a friend. And those who are in relationships, if you had a shallow relationship, like if you actually didn't know that person, you knew you would be like in big trouble. Like, <laughs> like how many know that when you start a relationship, you try to figure out like everything this person likes and everything they like to do. Like you're trying to figure out their favorite flower, their favorite candy, what kind of genre of movies and music they like. Because you want to know them intimately. How many know you can't be intimate with God in the shallows? Because he's... <laughs> He's deep. He's further. Your shallow faith, your shallow commitment is not going to take you anywhere. He wants it all. He's waiting for you at the deep end. He's like, that's great, but when you get over there, I'm going to show you who I am, and then I'm going to show you who you are. Because how many know that's how relationships like actually happen? Like I've, I've been dating my boyfriend for like a year and change, and like, I didn't know things about myself until <laughs> so I started dating him. And I was like, wow, there's a hint of my mom down there. <laughs> Who likes everything like, wow, look at that. <laughs> and it's the same thing with Jesus. You jump into the deep and you're like, wow, that's a new level of insecurity I didn't know I had buried in there. I didn't know till he revealed it to me in the deep. Wow, this is great. <laughs> um, let's be honest. How many how many know exactly what I'm talking about? Like, you know, you, you thought you overcame fears till you jumped straight into the deep and Jesus was like, now let me show you fear. <laughs> that your fear was, you know, this thing. <laughs> you're like, I already overcame that, Jesus. And then he takes you further, and you're like, oh, that's the underlying issue. Cool, cool. All right. <laughs> How do we work on this one? But that can only be at the deep. That can only be by pushing through. Not being afraid of being overwhelmed and overtaken by the love and mercy of God. Because the crazy thing is, if you continue with the last story we read of the woman, we know that shortly after that, Jesus asked him, and this is how you know I'm speaking truth right now, when you get to the deep. Because she asked him, well, what about your deep well? Like, you don't even have a bucket. Like, what are you going to do? And then right after that, he says, so are you married? That's how you know. <laughs> you get to the deep of Jesus. And he just, he just reveals something, not in a condemning way, but he's like, so, so your husband. And then quickly she was like, flustered, didn't know what to do. She just thought we were talking about water, now we're talking about marriage status. We just, and we find out that, that at the end of that, God reveals this to her, just so that she can later see salvation. And later he says, you know, daughter, go, oh, your sins, you've been freed. That's the beauty of the deep end. You're not going to get that in the shallow. You're not. So it goes back to verse 11. But the swamps and the marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Fruit, fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the rivers. Their leaves will not wither, nor will will their fruit fall. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. 
How beautiful is that? It goes right back. Marsh water, ankle deep water, nothing. No good for God. Just salt. Just salt. Nothing will grow. But in the deep end, in the river, we can see that trees bear fruit and they don't fall. That leaves serve as healing. How many want that? How many want to be a tree that forever bears fruit? Forever bears fruit. That everything that comes out of you will be of healing. How many want to be fresh? How many of us are still stuck on salty? <laughs> when God's calling us to be fresh, to be made new. I like to, like I said, a bunch of Bible verses reiterate this. Verse 20, thus by the fruits you will recognize them. What fruit are you producing? Would it be any that some would be, yeah, yeah, they're into deep end. Yeah, they're plugged into Jesus. Yeah, I can see it. I can see it, definitely. You know, because we all know, and I think Sylvester has said this, when they're growing, a banana and a plantain look very different. And I know that because I'm Puerto Rican. And my roommates asked me the other day, is that a banana? And I was like, no, it's a plantain. And they were like, oh, so you eat it raw? And I was like, no, don't try it. You're going to get constipation. <laughs> the truth. <laughs> and therefore, the fruit tells you what kind of tree it is. You probably get an apple tree, an orange tree, and a mango tree. Well, a mango tree would probably look different. But an apple tree and an orange tree during like non-harvest season, and you'd be looking like, wow, that's a really great tree. I wonder what it grows. But when it comes harvest season, when it's planted, when it's soiled, when it's bearing fruit all the time, that's an apple tree. That's an orange tree. I can tell because of the fruit, not because of the leaf, not because of the genealogy, not because of the seed, not because of anything, but because of its fruit. Jeremiah. But blessed is the one who trusts the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out roots by the stream. It does not fear when he comes. Its leaves are always green, and it has no worry in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. I'm giving you Old Testament and New Testament. These are promises of what happens when you're deep in the living water, when you're right next to it. Finally, a faith that endures. And I think I've been doubting on this one the most. What do you get at the deep end you got faith that endures. Not that little faith. Not the kind that you learn just from learning Sunday school. And I always say this. God is not interested in having grandchildren. Not interested in having brother-in-laws, sister-in-laws, nieces, nephews. No interest. Only sons and daughters. Which means the faith of your parents, the faith of others, the faith you grew up in Sunday school, that's not what God wants. That's, that's not what he's interested in. Your girl? No, that's not what he wants. He wants to call you son. He wants to call you daughter. And the truth is that this faith that endures, endurance only comes from testing. Endurance only comes after the work. How do you know I tried to jam with Bria this week? Still sore. Because <laughs> I don't do gyms. And there's an endurance you have to build. You just don't walk in, lift up 20 pounds, deadlift, boom, grunt, let go. On your first day, you can't. You'd break a lot of things. <laughs> if you did. And it's the same idea. If your faith is like my gym status, <laughs> we have a problem. <laughs> you need a faith that will endure. That means that you've worked out, you've tested, you've put on more weight, 
you've kept the Lord to just every day faithfully just pressing in, pressing in. And if you thought today I was going to tell you to read your Bible, pray, no. Because we know what we ought to do. We've been probably even told that most of our lives. But there is something in the deeper that God wants to connect with you. There is purpose in the deeper. You're not going to get your purpose in the shallow. And he's going to keep on pushing you towards that. That faith can't be this big. Because what God has planned for you is this big. So you need to, you need to bulk up to hold it up. If you know what I'm talking about. Because what the treasures he has for your life, what he actually wants to do with you, requires you to work out. In faith. Don't don't go to the gym and be like Mary Ellie said. We have to we have to stop. No, in faith. <clears throat> there comes a point once you dive into the deep in your relationship with God that you will no longer feel the bottom and the waves begin to crash over. And yet you're unfazed. Even though your faith is being stretched, at the same time, there's this overwhelming peace which only comes from knowing that God is doing a work in you. Finally, because I know we have exams. <laughs> and I can talk all day. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so like I said, there's a lot of swimming stories we could probably all share. And one of my favorites is, we were at this women's mommy daughter kind of thing. It's a pool party. And we had Ruby. She was about three. She was a little three year old in the group. And mid Bible study, little tyke jumped straight into the deep, drowning. 20 Spanish mothers freaking out. Her mother, without hesitation, jumps right after her. Only to remember when she hits the water that she too doesn't know how to swim. So now we have two people drowning. <laughs> Thankfully, one of the boys is a lifeguard, and so he jumped right in, picked up the daughter, took out the mom, and everybody's looking at this mom for like the next hour, just like, so why did you jump? <laughs> and I'm pretty sure as doctors, we're gonna have that point in our career where we're gonna ask our patients, so. Why? <laughs> like, have you ever been there doing CPD, those fourth and fifth termers, and they give you the clinical vignette, and you're like, why? <laughs> Good question. Like, you just escalated the problem. But that's the love of a parent, that you completely forsake your own. You completely give up your own life. You don't even care. You're going to push her up. You're going to save her, even if you die. One thing about the reason I, I gave this sermon was because some of you guys might still be with your shallow faith. You're not really sure about Jesus. But let me tell you a little bit about him. Not only is he the living water, but he was the one who one day jumped straight into the deep end, saw you drowning in your sin without hesitation. Without hesitation. He didn't hesitate. He saw you drowning in your own sin. And he jumped right in to save you. Gave his own life just so he can meet you in the deep end again. So originally, instead of diving in the deep end, I was gonna say the floaties are coming off. I'll exaggerate, but I couldn't find floaties at IJ. <laughs> there is a God who made everything you see in front of you. And he would have forsaken it all just to save you. And there was a God who gave his only son just so he can know you at a deeper level. And what I want to leave you with this morning is the challenge to jump further, jump deeper. There's never a point in our Christian walk that we are comfortable. Because nobody, nobody has reached the depth of his love yet. That's just too deep. So when you 
when I see those people, they're like, oh, you know, I'm really comfortable, I'm really great, you know, I just do this music thing, or I just do this vibe. No, deeper. You're never done swimming. You will never hit the bottom with God. It's a world waiting for you down there. A world. And one of the greatest treasures is that, if we go back to the previous verses, he says, whoever has this will have living water flowing out of them. So you jump straight into the deep end, and the deeper you go, the more people will come. Because like I said, we have a thirsty campus. And they're looking for that living water. So what's the push? Get deeper with God so that people can go deeper. So that you can be a well yourself. So that when your mouth opens, there's living water coming out. For all the hopeless, for all the anxious. I'd like to remind you that because it's not just about you. Jesus gave it all to you, but it's not just about you. <laughs> and the final verse. I know, concentrate on verse 3, but all of it's good. For the raging roar of the, of the stormy winds and the crashing waves cannot erode our faith in you. God has a constant flowing river whose sparkling streams bring joy and delight. Can I have a worship team up? Who brings joy and delight to his people. His river flows right through the city of God Most High into his holy dwelling place. God is in the midst of his city, secure and never shaken. So, where are my turn ones again? I'm a turn fours. This city is secure and never shaken. Tomorrow, you're secure. You're never shaken. You're, it doesn't matter how many you click for review. That doesn't matter. You're secure and unshaken. Why? Because he is faithful. Like Sly always says, he who began the good work in you. Will surely see it to completion. God bless you, CSA. And if you need prayer for any reason, you're freaking out for the exam tomorrow, you don't know Jesus, you want to dive in deeper, there will be people on the side that would love to pray for you. Thank you guys for having us with us with the word and the word and the word. I like already said the, the, the biggest time up front that was to pray with you. Please don't hesitate. Maybe you're going through that time that you just need somebody to join faith with you. And believe God with you on a call for, 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 for something. Maybe even at all. Just just walk out to us and let us pray with you. That is what the family is for. That is what the church family is doing. Bible says let them that are sick go to the elders of the church so they can pray for them. So anything at all, maybe you're not feeling well, maybe you're overwhelmed with, 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 the, with the materials, the, the issues of life, with, with school, anything at all, you just want to just walk to any of the leaders so we can just hold hands with you and pray with you. It is a call to the deep. A call to the deep. I already said that in the deeper place, God has something in store for us in the deeper place. And that is where he wants us to be in the deeper ends. So what can I say? So what can I So sure.
this call into the deep. Father, we are desperate to meet you in the deeper side. So spirit lead us to the place where our faith will be without borders. Father, take us to that place. Take us to that place. Take us to that, those depths. Those depths of relationship with you. That is what we are desperate for. May we know you and the power of your resurrection. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for our time in your presence. Into your hands we commit ourselves. Father, we stand in this gathering and we lift up our brethren who have exams this week. Term fours, term ones, undergrads, CFP. Father, we just commit ourselves before your throne and pray that you will see us through. May your grace abound and see us through, Lord. May your mighty hand be with us. May your presence be with us. 
Holy Spirit, we pray for leadings and your directions even within the next few hours as we go through our, our final preparation. Holy Spirit, lead us to, to, to focus on what we need to do. Lead us to focus on what we need to know for our exams. And as we go through the week, Lord, may your, may your presence be with us. Other our steps in you. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his countenance and make his face shine upon you. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit abide with us all now and always. Amen. Amen. Turn to a neighbor and say, neighbor, this week will be a good week. Just give somebody a hand.